Thank you for the invitation to share some of our work with all of you here. I want to discuss today how findings in neuroscience can pave the way towards a new generation of AI algorithms. Throughout my presentation, you can scan the QR codes for links to publications, data, and code. As all of you are well aware, there has been exciting progress in computer science over the last two decades. The examples shown here highlight how, in some specific domains, machines can reach human level performance. And in several cases, even surpass humans. Despite these major advances, it is very clear that there remain major challenges ahead. Notwithstanding the successes in chess and self-driving cars, biological intelligence still outperforms machines in the vast majority of cognitive tasks. Here are a couple of examples. AI systems are fragile and can be deceived quite easily. Many of you are probably familiar with adversarial attacks, where we take an image that is correctly classified, we introduce minimal amounts of noise, and the algorithm makes a mistake. For example, this panda here gets misclassified as a gibbon upon introducing imperceptible amounts of noise. Another challenge in AI is continual learning and catastrophic forgetting. We can do visual recognition and play chess and drive and learn new languages and dance. Machines tend to specialize in a single task. For example, if we teach an algorithm to recognize scissors and cups, it can do so quite well. Next, we take the same exact architecture and we train it to distinguish chairs and tables. The system becomes an expert in chairs and tables, but forgets about the scissors and cups. Cognition transcends pattern recognition and requires forms of knowledge integration that are well beyond current capabilities. Consider this image. A state-of-the-art image captioning system correctly infers that there's a person standing in front of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but there's much more going on here. This girl is pretending that the Tower of Pisa is an ice cream. She's holding a cone and licking the ice cream. The AI system missed all the fun in this picture. There are abundant bidirectional interactions between AI and neuroscience. AI algorithms have essentially helped advance almost any scientific field and neuroscience is no exception. But today I want to focus on how neuroscience can help build better AI. Neuroscientists have been building models of visual recognition for decades. Going back to the seminal work of Fukushima's Neocognitron and Tommy Poggio's HMAX, among many others. The last decades have seen a major expansion of these ideas by adding many layers and using back propagation to adjust the weights using supervised learning based on millions of examples. Yet these models barely scratch the surface of the complexity of nervous systems. Here's a diagram that illustrates the mesoscopic connectivity between different parts of the visual system. Here on the bottom, we have the retina. Here we have the primary visual cortex. Each one of these boxes represents a different visual area. In the best case scenario, current AI systems constitute an approximation to the black boxes shown here. That is a tiny fraction of the diagram. Note that this is only vision without even considering the additional complexity due to the rest of the brain. Three main types of architectural motifs are largely missing in current AI. One is horizontal connections, top-down connections, and also spatial-temporal integration. Today, I'd like to give you three examples of how adding these neural circuit elements can have important implications to build better AI systems. First, I will tell you how horizontal connections help perform pattern completion. Next, I will show you how top-down connections can be used to perform zero-shot visual search. And finally, I will give you a brief example of spatial-temporal integration 
during contextual research. The work on horizontal connections and pattern completion was carried out by three amazing grad students in the lab shown here, Bill Lotter, Martin Shrimp, and Han Ling Tan. This is Piazza San Marco in Venezia in Italy. You can probably interpret the image quite well. This is a particularly difficult day when the piazza was flooded. Without much effort or doing sophisticated math, you can infer what the objects are, where they are, what is happening, what is not happening. Human cognition is particularly good at making inferences from partial information. In particular, you can recognize the chairs and the tables, as well as the ducks, even from just a handful of pixels. You may have never seen white tables floating in water, yet you have no problem completing the patterns and deciphering what is going on. Here's a more systematic quantification of pattern completion. We conducted a series of behavioral experiments where we showed objects with different levels of occlusion. Objects were presented very briefly with exposures ranging from 25 to 150 milliseconds. And we asked subjects to categorize the images into five possible labels. Here are the results showing human performance on the y-axis as a function of visibility. You can ignore the colors for now, which represent different exposure times. When the objects are 100% visible, the task is very easy and subjects are essentially at 100%. As visibility decreases, performance drops. What is quite remarkable is that human vision shows robustness even up to approximately 20% visibility. We used a technique called backward masking next to measure how fast subjects can perform pattern completion. Immediately after showing the image, a noise mask is shown, essentially interrupting visual processing. For short exposure times, backward masking disrupts pattern completion. Here on the bottom are the results that I showed you in the previous slide without backward masking. And here on the right are the new results with backward masking. It costs about 50 milliseconds to perform pattern completion based on the behavioral measurements. We can also insert electrodes inside the human brain in cases of patients with epilepsy and investigate the activity in visual cortex while the subjects perform the same tasks. Here I'm showing you intracranial field potentials recorded from one electrode in inferior temporal cortex. There's a rapid, selective, and consistent response, which constitutes the hallmark of visual responses in cortex. Importantly, when we show the occluded images, the selective responses are still there, but they are delayed by a few tens of milliseconds, consistent with the behavioral results that I just showed. In other words, it costs also about 50 milliseconds to perform pattern completion at the physiological level. We tested many deep convolutional neural network models on the same task. Even though these models won visual labeling competitions, they all fell short of human performance for heavily occluded objects, as can be seen here by comparing all the colored lines to the black line, which indicates human performance. Inspired by the anatomy, behavioral, and neurophysiological observations, we added horizontal recurrent connections to the neural network models. As a proof of principle, here I'm showing horizontal connections only added to the last layer of AlexNet. These horizontal connections had symmetric weights that depended exclusively on the fully visible objects. This is known as a Hopkin network or a tract of recurrent neural network. It can be shown analytically that such attractor networks can perform pattern completion. Indeed, adding those horizontal connections substantially improved recognition of heavily occluded objects. Furthermore, if we train those recurrent connections, as shown here in RNN5, we can achieve human level performance.
These observations led us to suggest that cortex can function in two operational modes. A fast, largely feed forward and bottom up mode that skips all the recurrent connections and a slower recurrent mode that can make inferences on pattern completion. This computational flexibility to reroute information in a task specific manner is likely to play a fundamental role in visual cognition and is largely unexploited by current AI systems. I will switch gears now to talk about the role of top-down connections during zero-shot visual search. This work was carried out by a stellar postdoc named Mizan. Before I go on to talk about visual search, I want to briefly mention that saccadic eye movements play a critical role in seeing understanding. If you have never thought about eye movements, you may not even be aware that we constantly move our eyes we actively sample images by making rapid, relatively large eye movements called saccades about three or four times a second, as shown in this example, where a subject is looking at this image for 12 seconds. Here's a classical children's game where you have to find this character called Waldo in this complex image. It is very hard to find Waldo. In the interest of time, I will just show you the answer. Here's Waldo. There are four fundamental properties to visual search. The first one is selectivity. That is to distinguish the target from the distractors. The second one is invariance because we want to find the target irrespective of changes in appearance. For example, when you're looking for your car keys, you may have to consider different scales, positions, occlusion, etc. The third fundamental property is efficiency, because we want to avoid exhaustive exploration of the entire image. And finally, the fourth property is generalization, because we want to be able to find objects even if we are exposed to those objects only once. Here's an example of one of several tasks that we conducted to study visual search. Here we show a target object, for example, in this case, cats. And next we present a search image. The subject, has to move their eyes until they locate the target object. Here I'm showing you the cumulative performance in this task as a function of fixation number. If subjects were moving their eyes randomly, they would find the target in the first fixation one sixth of the time, and then in the second fixation two sixths of the time, and so on. Instead, humans perform well above chance as shown here by the red curve. We took several ingredients from neuroscience to build a computational model that incorporates top-down connections to perform transformation invariant zero-shot visual search. The model starts with a target image and processes the image through a deep convolutional neural network. We think of this network as an approximation to the cascade of computations along the ventral visual cord. Next, the model stores the information about the target in a visual buffer, a form of working memory, which we tentatively ascribe uh, to the prefrontal cortex. When we show the search image, the search image is processed through the exact same ventral visual cortex. Next, the visual buffer is used to modulate in a top-down fashion the representation of the target image, enhancing those features that we're looking for. This creates an attention map. The model selects the maximum of this attention map in a winner-take-all fashion and makes a saccade to this target object. If the target object is not found, the model applies inhibition of return and goes on to the next maximum, thus generating a sequence of saccades. Importantly, the model is not trained with any behavioral data. The ventral visual cortex is pre-trained using ImageNet. I showed you how humans search for targets in this task, as shown here in red. The model can also find the target objects much more efficiently than by random exploration. And surprisingly, the model can match human performance, even though we're not training the model with any human data. Because the model is not trained with the target objects or the search images either, 
the model can do zero shot visual search. That is, it can find any object in any image. Moreover, the model can perform transformation invariant visual search for novel objects. My final and brief example will be about spatial temporal integration for contextual reasoning and was carried out by Neng Mizan. In a normal interactive setting, I would be asking you to tell me what this object is. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it, though in most of our experiments, you only get less than 200 milliseconds. Despite the extra time, it is very hard to recognize these objects unless you have seen one of my talks before. Now I'm going to show you the whole image. Now it should be pretty straightforward for you to recognize the object in the white box. All the additional contextual information radically changes the game. Our visual systems expertly integrate information both over space and across time when interpreting a scene. As illustrated at the beginning in the example with the Tower of Pisa, this ability to make inferences by integrating information in space and time is mostly absent in current AI. This is a complex slide. We built a proof of principle computational model that can reason about context by putting together two streams. One stream processes information in the fovea at high resolution and focuses on the target object. The other stream has lower resolution and processes peripheral information. Note that what is fovea and what is the periphery changes every time you move your eyes. The two streams are combined in an LSTM model that can integrate information both in space as well as over time. And therefore it can jointly reason about the objects and the, their context. This architecture is inspired by fundamental neuroanatomical and neurophysiological constraints. We conducted a series of psychophysical experiments to study how humans use contextual information and show that the model can provide a reasonable first order approximation to contextual reason. I invite you to scan this QR code for further information. In summary, I provided three examples of how insights from neuroscience can lead to better AI algorithms. In the first example, I showed you how incorporating horizontal connections can lead to the ability to make inferences about missing information and therefore complete patterns. In the second example, I showed you how incorporating top-down connections leads to the ability to perform efficient and invariant visual search, even in a zero-shot manner for objects that have never been seen before. Finally, I briefly provided a glimpse of initial steps towards understanding how different brain components can integrate information in space and time to perform contextual research. The main take home message that I would like to leave you with is the notion that we're barely scratching the surface of the enormous and fascinating complexity of nervous systems. Current AI only takes advantage of a tiny fraction of the capacity of our brains. By shedding light on the mechanisms of biological intelligence, we will be able to make major strides towards building the next generation of intelligent machines.